All right, I prepared something from my good friend Tracy. They say the eight qualities of a good journalist are curiosity, honesty, fearless, loyalty, kind, trustworthy, passionate, and tenacious. That's Tracy in a nutshell. Right? Plus a total smarty pants, an LGBT media icon, and our own lesbian newspaper mogul. She's our champion. She writes for us, our diverse community, the Chicago LGBTQ community. Tracy is an equal opportunity writer. She's written about Vernita Gray, Marie Kuda, Barbara Giddings, Chuck Renslow, Jim Flint, Barack Obama, the gay press, and the Chicago gay community. She was a leader in the March on Springfield for marriage equality. And for the Chicago Women's March. She worked tirelessly to bring, organize, and oversee the Chicago Gay Games. Remember that? She helped organize an LGBT youth homeless conference, an LGBT seniors conference, and has advocated for years to bring tiny homes to Chicago. Tracy helped to create the hashtag Hire Trans campaign at the LGBT job fair that she helped organize at the Center on Halstead. Her publications have included Gay Life, Outlines, Windy City Times, the Chicago Reader, and, and she supported the launch of En La Vida, Black Lines, and Night Spots. She's had her detractors, but like Michelle Obama, when they went low, she went high. Tracy celebrates life by loving and supporting our community. Her decades of advocacy and support of the LGBT community have been a lifelong commitment. Working for social justice, for women's equality, for LGBT equality, Tracy has helped us to raise our voices loudly and proudly. She attends women's soccer, basketball, and tackle football games. She watches and makes queer cinema. Tracy loves going to the baton, and she loves to dance her pants off. <laughs> Back in the day, Tracy used to hand deliver the paper to Mountain Moving. She had our flyer printed and she published our events. She found us a new space when we were kicked out of a church because of their misogyny and lesbophobia. Tracy's helped countless other organizations throughout the years, just like she did the coffee house. She always gives 1,000%, whatever's needed. We know that Tracy is all in to help strengthen, preserve, support, and empower our community. All of us here, Tracy, Tracy, hope that you can feel the love, loyalty, appreciation, and pride. Thank you for being our eyes and ears to the Chicago LGBT queer scene for the past three plus decades. We thank you and your hardworking staff for, love, for your love and commitment to keeping us informed, educated, activated, and entertained. Woo. So it's always hard to uh, begin uh, your remarks with apologies. It, it doesn't always bode well to what you're going to say. But I apologize to you. Uh, although I have my speech nicely written out, I got in my Uber without my glasses. <laughs> oh, I might. I might. Can I keep them through the speech? I might. <laughs> If I lose, make, make sure I give them back to you. If I lose my way, I, I may end up reading this, but I know what I'm going to say. You know, while I would like to think that I've made accomplishments in my life on, in my own, um, on my own, these days I'm really best known as having been Chuck Renslow's partner for 35 years. And I met Tracy, I thought it was 83. But certainly it was at the beginning of our careers. She was a um, beginning journalist. I was a beginning attorney. And uh, at that time, a new light in Chuck Renslow's eyes. And I knew Tracy working for Gay Life newspaper, the newspaper that Chuck owned. And Tracy was a nice woman. I mean, we got along. 
sometimes in, sometimes in the uh, editorial meetings we disagreed, but she, she was a nice woman. So Chuck began, at some point, uh, entered negotiations to sell gay life to Jeff McCourt. And at some point, the negotiations went very, very wrong. And Chuck came into work one morning and found the newspaper was gone. The staff had gone. They had taken all of the journalistic files. And they had taken them to Jeff McCourt's new newspaper, Windy City Times. And for a brief point in time, that was disruptive. Chuck was upset. He, he filed a lawsuit. The lawsuit was eventually settled. Life went on. But Tracy was still in his life. And I asked him one time, Chuck, I don't understand because I would never speak to that staff again. <laughs> but yet you still have this loyalty towards this woman. And he told me, in his life there were only two people that he could truly trust. One was Bill Kelly, and one was Tracy Bain. So I need to make another apology at this point. As I get older, I find that I also get less able to control my emotions. So you'll forgive me if I, I tear up. Tracy thought that perhaps I was going to roast her. Um, that might be easier. So. He told me that there were only these two people he could really trust, and he said the reason why was that, number one, they were both extremely intelligent and willing to share their intelligence with him. Number two, they cared for the community more than they cared for themselves. And number three, he could trust them to always tell the truth, even if it wasn't what he wanted to hear. We all know Tracy well enough to know that there's very little that we don't know about her. She's certainly a legend in Chicago. She's known throughout the state, and, and many people throughout the country would know her name. So I want to tell you a couple things about her that you don't know, or you might not know. You might not know that she and Jean were friends with Chuck throughout his entire life. They were frequent visitors, and uh, I spent Christmases with them. You might not know that Chuck died a very difficult death. It was long, and it was painful. And at some point, I went to California to visit my family, and fully expecting to come back and find him harassing the male nurses at Weiss. And instead, they called me and said, you need to come home tonight. So I flew home in a, a really terrible flight. It was turbulent starting in Iowa. And it was just, it was terrible. I arrived at the hospital at 3 AM to find him with about 13 hoses and machines and a thing stuck down his throat. And he was trying desperately to tell me something but I couldn't understand him. So the hospital had told me, and his caretaker told me, that among the people that was with him when they began life support was Tracy. So I called her that morning, and I asked her what he was trying to tell me, and I asked for her advice and her counsel as I made the most dis difficult decision that I could possibly make. So when I look at Tracy, and I think this is one of, I think, four people that I asked to speak at Chuck's memorial. This was somebody that, for as long as I knew him, was present in his life, somebody that he admired somebody that he wished the best for. That's the Tracy that I know. And I, I couldn't come in and roast you tonight, Tracy. Thank you very, very much. I love you. What accolades can I sincerely express Tracy Bang's true dedication and commitment. 
She has worked tirelessly to inform and educate the LGBTQIABCDEFG <laughs> community at large. A community which has not been favorable or accepting at times your heartfelt efforts. This community has experienced many ups and downs, but you have held steadfast, continuing to hold on where many have not. You have been our constant. I admire and love you for being who you are. I remember years ago when you first asked if you could cover my parties or different events, and if you could take pictures of me. I looked at you and said, honey, I am in the closet. But you may ask some of the other women at the party if it's OK. A few years later, I remember telling you that I decided to come out of the closet. And boy, did you take pictures and write about me. I was exposed to any and all. Being a woman of color, I was very fearful of what people felt about me. You have a way of making it OK, making me feel proud of who I am as a black lesbian. You did that for me. I became a reluctant activist. It was like a crown put on my head and you helped me to wear it with pride. I remember when some of my students spoke about seeing my picture, I taught special ed, seeing my picture in the gay paper. I stood shocked and was taken aback that they had seen my picture. I pulled myself together and said to them, oh, you saw my picture? Did I look good? <laughs> I smiled and I kept it moving. I didn't need to give them the response they may have expected, but kept it positive and moved on. You have covered many of my parties and events, and you have made other people of color feel a part of this community. You were constantly present at many of my events and parties, usually the only white girl there, <laughs> or sent staff to make us feel included. You helped to give many people of color a voice in this community. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Tracy Bain, for making the impossible possible. Ooh, um, hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, it's wonderful to see all your smiling faces here. I'm glad we're all here for the same reason, of course, it's Tracy. Um, uh, as Sharon explained, uh, my name is Kirk Williamson, and my title at Windy City Times is art director slash associate editor slash senior account representative. If you talk to anybody currently on the staff of Windy City Times, um, and their titles will include multiple slashes, as does mine. <laughs> Trying to put out a small but influential community newspaper requires wearing many hats, while hopefully not getting a big head about it. And today, we are here to honor journalist, slash editor, slash publisher, slash organizer, slash mentor, slash friend, Tracy Bain. <laughs> Tracy's untiring commitment to standing in to get the job done, to get the news out on the street, and to get our community moving forward in a positive direction has served as a beacon for countless community members, young and old, and inspired us to action. Over the course of 35 years, her dedication and the sheer breadth of her work have helped tell the story of Chicago's and, by extension, the world's LGBT community, a history enshrined for the edification of generations yet to come. 
Looking back at the start of Tracy Bame's career, the logistical business of the news business was much harder in almost every way. This was before desktop publishing, before internet, email, PDFs, cell phones. Uh, putting out a newspaper required constant work marathons lasting all day and often all through the night. Uh, but the deadline is the deadline. And no matter how close you get to the edge of that deadline, you can never fall off. And she never has. Um, so the paper, the paper in its earliest days uh, broke silences, helped LGBTQ people find each other, and drove the community to become what it would become. One wonders if issues like marriage equality would even have been a possibility had it not been for the work of early pioneers like Tracy Bame. In part, in part, we owe her and many like her a debt of gratitude for paving the way from a silent past to a loud and proud present and future. Now, Tracy has worked on relationships with those in government and community organizations and leaders, all of which helped build awareness and trust of Tracy, of Windy City Times, and all the other publications that carried her name as publisher. Uh, like Outlines, Black Lines, In La Vida, Night Lines, Night Spots, The Out Guide, Identity, Clout, just to name a few. I'm sure I'm forgetting some. <laughs> I've been at this for a while. Um, in addition to her work in journalism, her leadership roles in organizations such as the 2006 Gay Games in Chicago and the first LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce in Chicago helped create community helped to build her skills and took her to new levels of business and community involvement. And with each achievement, she remained grounded in her purpose and her connection to all members of our community, giving a much needed platform for all of us to speak our minds. Winnie City Times is known for groundbreaking reporting packages on issues such as race, LGBTQ youth homelessness, AIDS, marriage, and so much more which upped the community's understanding of these issues and created an environment for change. Tracy, that's you. Um, the members of Windy City Times are here to thank you for putting your drive and talents into the field of the LGBTQ community journalism. We congratulate you for your years and accomplishments, which are too many to list, and thank you for your work and creativity, which has kept up Windy City Times alive so that we could all have jobs. So, you know, thank you for that. That's kind of awesome of you to do that. It's a tribute in itself that so many of us have been at the paper for at least a decade, and some of us for well over two decades. I'm at about 18 and a half years myself, and as I've reassured you on many occasions, don't worry, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, speaking of which, quick show of hands. How many in this room have worked for Tracy at Windy City Times in any capacity? Editing, writing, photography, distribution, you know, bringing her food, whatever. Oh, so Tracy, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Tracy, I want you to look at all these hands and know that we all appreciate you and thank you for recognizing our talents and making us part of the team. And a quick thanks to all in the community who have supported our efforts at Windy City Times, whether that be through loyal readership mindful and respectful debate, or supporters of our longtime advertisers without whose support we couldn't do anything. One of those longtime advertisers is Sidetrack. So a quick thank you to Sidetrack and the supporters of Sidetrack. Thank you, Tracy, we love you. Thank you. So good evening. Good evening. This is a time for celebration on so many fronts, but today, but today we're gonna to focus on the 35th anniversary of LGBT journalism here in the city of Chicago as exemplified by Tracy and her posse of journalists, including the many that she has mentored, sales representatives, advertisers, artists, delivery people, and everyone who has recognized the importance of an independent media. Media that has had the audacity to see community in its many iterations and full spectrum. I knew Tracy before I began to work for her, I began to work for her 28 years ago. What? Oh, God. But the beauty of long-term friendships is that we get to grow and learn from each other. We serve as witnesses to truths that others would deny us, and we support each other's journeys. 
Working for Tracy offered me an insight into a world larger than I had imagined. She always operated on an internal moral compass of what was just and what was good journalism. But the paper I soon realized was more than just good journalism. It was also a vehicle, an institution by which to build community. When I was selling ads, I was selling the community on the significance of self, the importance of recognizing and validating self. And when I was selling to straight businesses, I was educating them on the significance of who we were and the power of our dollar. And I had to answer questions that would now seem ridiculous or even insulting. But I would say, you're in private company. Ask me, what is it that you need to know? And they did. All that seems funny right now, given the LGBT affinity groups and the support of large corporations. But you have to remember, 35 years ago, our love was illegal. It took a vision, a leap of faith, sacrifice, an endurance of all things hard and hurtful to achieve that vision. And so here we are in 2019, the city of Chicago with an African-American lesbian mayor? What? We had all openly gay aldermen and judges. And whose house are we standing in right now? Art and Pepe built this house right here. None of this would be possible without people who took real risk and they suffered real losses to achieve all the wins that we have today. So there are many to thank, but today we say thank you to Tracy, to Jean, and to her posse, who continue to help to build the world we want to live in, to love in, to survive in. And so on that note, Cheryl Corley, where are you? There you are. <laughs> I give you Tracy Baim a most cherished icon in our community. We are obviously here to talk about your 35 years, but, but I wanted to go further back <laughs> because I wanted to um, talk about your family just a little bit because um, you often talk a lot about how your mother, Joy Darrell, inspired you and you and your sister Marcy and your brother Clark honor her with a memorial scholarship. Your mother and your stepfather Steve Pratt were both journalists at the Chicago Tribune. Uh, your mother was also a freelancer and a managing editor at the Chicago Defender, the, the black newspaper when it was a daily. Your father here, Hal Bain, taking pictures. <laughs> is a photographer. So all of this just boiled down to genetics, right? I mean, <laughs> there was really no way you could not be a journalist, yeah? I think it was a combination of genetics and environment. Because um, my stepfather came from a journalism family. Um, my mother's father was in World War II, worked for Stars and Stripes, which my partner Jean worked for um, in the 80s. Um, so I think it's both environment and being around it. I remember in the 1960s when Hubert Humphrey was running for president, I was probably five years old, and I was taking a red wheelbarrow around campaigning for him. Um, I remember writing about the Vietnam War in grammar school. I created a newsletter for my grammar school. Um, and we covered political issues uh, for Walt Disney Grammar School. So I, I think it was just like a comp a, almost like a compulsion to get the word out, whether that was about my block that I lived on, or my school, or my community. Well, you also created a family newsletter, I heard. I did. I, it was first called TNT, Top News Today. Um, <laughs> and then it was called the Tribune News Team. And I had to change the name because my stepfather was illegally copying at the Chicago Tribune, was, was uh, subsidizing my newspaper because they were making copies at night. Um, and then my mom started it doing it at the Chicago Defender. So it had many different names. And my sister always remembered it that I would tell her grades to the relatives in it, because I did put everybody's grades in the newsletter, but she remembered it worse than it actually was. When yeah, she went yeah. back and read them, they weren't that bad. <laughs> but 
it, yes, I would, I would actually be pretty brutal. Um, and I was covering Watergate in my family newsletter. Yeah. yeah. Well, I understand you, you divulged a lot about your siblings. I was wondering if you ever had approached them to be an editor so they would know, you know, uh, and could comment about what you had put in there. When I stopped doing it for a while, my mom actually put out her own newsletter so that she could counter the narratives that I had put out about how much partying they had done because there was a lot of illegal illicit things happening at adult parties on, in my house when I was a kid. I got to meet Bette Midler as a result and, and things that were great, but there was also a lot of things going on that were probably shouldn't have been going around <laughs> when I was 10 years old. All right, so 10 years old, you had this inside track with the, um, the managing editor at the newspaper. So as I understand, you were published in the Chicago Defender at, at 10 years old. At 10 years old, I had a kid's yeah. consumer column in the Chicago Defender. You can actually find them in the Chicago Defender archives. I went back and looked because they digitized everything. And there's Tracy Bame writing about kids' consumer items. Yeah. <laughs> like what? What, what would um, you Bikes. I know I wrote about bike safety. I, I <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Compulsion. Yes. All right. So you wrote for your high school newspaper, you went to Drake, and you wrote there, your college newspaper. Your 1983 essay, folks, is on the back in there, uh, and you can see where her professor marked, you know, <laughs> things that uh, they were impressed with or not. Yeah, and, journalism school taught me what not to be. <laughs> you were openly gay. Uh, you graduated in 1984, and your professor said, well, don't know if you have too many career options available to you. Yeah, you know, I do say that it was paternalistic more than mean, but paternalism can be mean, and I've experienced paternalism from men um, a lot of my life. And in, in college, it was very much, they were like, oh, you know, we're just trying to protect you. Um, we don't think you can be, and they weren't wrong. Um, my stepfather worked at the Chicago Tribune, and he knew of four openly gay reporters at the Tribune back then, and they were friends of his, and they knew he was cool, so they were out to him. But they couldn't be out to management, and when some of them died of AIDS complications, that they were kept in the closet in their obits in the Chicago Tribune in the 1980s. Um, so it wasn't wrong. Um, Randy Schultz was one of the very few openly gay reporters at a mainstream media outlet in 1984 when I graduated. Yeah. I wanted to go work for Ms. Magazine or something like that. I didn't even know there was a gay press that existed because I had gone away from 80 to 84. I was in Des Moines, Iowa. I, did a, I started a feminist newspaper at college, of course. Um, <laughs> but I didn't know there even existed a gay press because I didn't know about it before I left for college. So how'd you get started? So in 1984, when I graduated, the first month I did do a couple freelance pieces on heater safety for um, the Chicago Tribune. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I'm not writing about heater safety. Um, but my mother had heard about a job opening, a part-time job opening at Gay Life newspaper. And the benefit, and I think today in journalism as well, is that I knew how to run the typesetting equipment. I walked in and said, oh, that's a Mergenthaler. I know how to run that refrigerator. Um, and and I, I immediately could sit down and, t and put out copy. Yeah. And, I said, and I said, here's my Pentax camera. I can take photos. You need me to deliver the paper, I'll deliver the paper, and I did. Um, I could paste up the boards, I could do every single thing about a newspaper. So I started as a part-time reporter, and 12 months later I was managing editor. The attrition in the gay press was pretty, the attrition was, it wasn't really because I was great, it's because the pay was horrible, the hours sucked, and it was really intense, and I didn't even realize a lot of the people that I was working with weren't using their real names. There was a guy whose byline you'll see here, his name's Paul Cotton on the bylines. When he left, he said, well, that's not my real name. We don't use our real name here because it would hurt our careers. So I was, Tracy Bain, Tracy Bain. <laughs> um, always out. Always out, always <laughs> out. But it was, it was shocking to me and I realized how serious it was that I was choosing this path. It was, that was it. You know, I was not gonna go into the mainstream after I did that. You started in the midst of a really chaotic and tragic time for the country, because this was the AIDS epidemic that was uh, causing so much uh, turmoil. Um, so talk a little bit about how that uh, affected your work and how that affected the newspaper. When I started in 1984, there were fewer than 100 diagnosed cases of, of HIV AIDS in Chicago. In fact, it had really just been named AIDS. It had been called GRID, grade-related immune deficiency up until a, a short time before I started at Gay Life Newspaper. 
I believe that having been dropped into the middle of a war zone at age 21, it impacted my entire life because I was covering the death of people my age or slightly older or, or much older on a daily basis. I was, there was a gallows humor in sometimes about it with people like Danny Sotomayor or Robert Ford or Ron Sable or other people that I took their photos of. I, I always, I can visualize them without needing these photos because often they would say, you know, this is the one I want you to use for my obituary, Tracy. I took a lot of, uh, a lot of people, a lot of men, mostly men, um, and took that job so seriously because nobody else was covering their lives. Nobody else was writing their obituaries. I said in the back in that essay in 83, I don't want to write obits unless they're about education. And to write somebody's obit is the greatest honor I ever do. I just wrote one three weeks ago for Rolla Klepek with Owen Keenan. Um, on a regular basis, I still am writing obits about people in this uh, community who have mentored me and were there for me. Um, I'm dying of all different sorts of things now. Um, but in the middle of an epidemic, when you know, you know what, there wasn't anything in 84. There wasn't even any drugs or anything. We had staff members. Bob Bearden, who co-founded Windy City Times, he was partners with Jeff McCourt. He got, we founded Windy City Times in September 85. We were working out of their apartment on Melrose Avenue in the lake for the first year. Within four weeks, Bob was diagnosed with AIDS. And he never came out of that apartment for months because there was nothing for him. My partner at the time was a nurse and she would get him pain medications, but there was nothing. Our, our travel reporter, Richard Cash, got diagnosed and died a week later. Um, we would, you know, the community was am amazingly rallying for itself and for, you know, for each other. It was a time when lesbians stepped up and people of color and white people and all those people who in the 70s were kind of pulled apart by all the isms used, used it as a chance to glue together, at least temporarily, to fight the external forces that were much more easily defined then as, than they are now. Um, so it was, a, it was a heady time, as they say. It was a time of hope and fearlessness and resilience that we're kind of in now again, certainly on women's access to abortion and health care and LGBT marriage isn't a given. So in many ways, I just, it just has been a through line that these stories had to be told. Maybe many more people are telling those stories now, but they're not telling all the stories, and they're certainly not telling it from all the angles that I still see are out there missing. Bring me back to um, your mom, because she actually wrote a story for you uh, uh, about AIDS. And so I was wondering, you know, uh, what you thought about how was that working with your mother and essentially being her boss? I mean, did you tell her she did a good job? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really good at compliments. But um, so my mom loved Cuba. She had this um, connection to Cuba starting from the 1950s when she covered um, Fidel Castro in the mountains before the revolution. And she went back there illegally many times in her life. In fact, the last time she went back was after she died. My stepfather took her ashes into the waters of Cuba illegally, which I only found out about truly, uh, that I remember anyway, after he died. We got a bill from the federal government um, <laughs> that, that he had refused to pay. So it had gathered interest, let's put it that way, $7,500. Um, so, um, but she loved Cuba. She had gone back many times illegally. She'd go through Canada. She'd figure out ways to go on church monitoring things. And one time she was going around, I think it was around probably 87, and I had known about the AIDS quarantine wards in Cuba, and people, saw, you know, people, some people said that was the good way to give health care. Other people, of course, said it was wrong. And so I wanted her to try to get the story. I was a little worried, because I know my mother, she would go off the path and she might get arrested, which, you know, she had done some things uh, bolder than me, that's for sure. Um, so she did. She went off the path. She went and she found, and she was able to interview people and did this great story. I don't remember editing it very severely. Anybody that knows me is I'm a pretty passive editor. Um, I, I don't, I'm not a stickler for a lot of things. I just want to make sure that it can read well. And uh, she also typeset for us. She would come in and just typeset listings for me. I have pictures of her sitting at a little Mac, 512K, um, and entering all, all the stuff. She was, you know, she was immensely supportive of my career. I, 
you know, she died uh, in 1996, and I had been in this work for enough time that she saw I was on a path, and gratefully, she also had met Jean. Um, so Jean, my partner of 25 years, got to meet my mother before she passed away. So, I, you know, I, no one ever wants to lose their mother, but I, I know that she knew the three of us children, my sister Marcy, who's wonderfully here today, my brother who lives in England, all three of us felt really wonderfully supported by her. That's nice to have. We talk about um, you co-founding uh, Windy City Times. You, you left uh, a couple years later and uh, founded Outlines in 1987, and you were actually competitors, I guess, with Windy City Times for many years. Uh, then in 2000, you bought Windy City Times and merged it with Outlines. So you were the boss, right? You were just the boss. I got my baby back from foster care. <laughs> some things I just can't say in public until some other people are not with us anymore. Okay, <laughs> okay so we'll get the backstory later. <laughs> These are for those late night drinks in the back of the bar or whatever, so we'll get that. Well, uh, somebody mentioned, um, I think it was Pat talked about you uh, dancing, and, and I've seen you dance, and yeah, you're a pretty good dancer. And, and I understand that you were a, a pretty mean soccer player, soccer player too. Where's my soccer mates? There's some <laughs> soccer mates here. Soccer mates. Um, so I wanted to, to ask you, you know, what did you learn from the team sport of soccer, perhaps, that, that's helped you? Well, let me just say, my generation benefited from Title IX in ways that I don't think anybody will ever appreciate. Uh, <laughs> The reason I did the gay games in 2006 with an amazing team of people, some of them here today, um, is because sports can change the world. It's how we, unfortunately, in the United States often seize the world. So when people like Billie Jean King or Renee Richards or um, other folks have come out over the years, that really does impact society. Um, in 1973 or so, when Title IX was passed, it transformed. I played Little League um, in Chicago because my coach, well, half my team didn't know I was a girl. But my, my coach knew I was a girl, and um, I know he, he let that happen because he would have been sued. Um, but he was nice enough to not make me have to sue. Um, and then I started to play soccer thanks to a woman named Margie Lopez who I went to school with at Lane Tech. There was no high school soccer at Lane Tech. I played softball there, but um, I got on this independent team. And they were a little bit older women, most of us, except Kathy Milano here, were, they were a little bit older than me. And I knew they were, most of them were gay. They were not out to me, um, but I knew, you just know. And we went on traveling excursions around the world. We went to Germany to play soccer uh, for two weeks in 1980, a couple months before I went to college. Playing in team sports, probably any sports, but for me, team sports, taught me how to fail, how to succeed, how to work with other people. I'm still learning how to do that today. But for 25 years, I got to play. You know, my knees and my hands and my whole body is not going to let me kick many more soccer balls in my life. But I, I feel so fortunate to have had sports in my life in a way that definitely transformed me and gave me a confidence. Um, I experienced some pretty bad things in my teenage years, um, an attack at one point. And sports got me through that, right? Sports was my religion. And I am so grateful to the women who fought for Title IX because I know some of those sports experiences never would have happened for most of my generation and this generation too without the battles of the women who were kept out of those courts and those fields before. That's here for sports. Well, you know, you've been a really prolific writer and an editor. Uh, in addition to your newspaper work, you've written several books uh, you were a major force. We heard the list behind the gay games, uh, instrumental in the push for marriage equality in Illinois, been the executive producer for films and play, even created that game that I didn't know a lot of answers to and <laughs> that's so gay. <laughs> you were involved with the uh, Youth Storage Initiative, which I really found fascinating. <laughs> And the uh, tiny homes competition as you looked at ways to help homeless youth. So really, I, just a couple of questions. The first was, when do you sleep? <laughs> 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 and, 
And then uh, among all of those things, do you have a, a favorite or two that you wanted to just touch on? For a very long time, newspapers was all I was doing, not that it was not enough. Um, but when I started working on um, the gay games, two things happened. One is I got out of my bat cave and had to leave the city and go around the world and do outreach. And it really um, taught me that you can, there's many ways to tell stories and to ha transform communities. And so, but after the gay games, which was seven years of volunteer hell, but wonderful, I'm glad I did it. Um, I really was burned out on this community. Because believe me, the infighting around the gay games was as bad as our community ever gets. A lot of people told us that we were gonna fail. You know, they tried to sabotage it. Montreal paid off Chicagoans to attack us from within. I'm not kidding. That it was Just brutal. like the regular Olympics. Yeah, it was brutal. <laughs> and we were all volunteers. Um, and so it, after it, I was, and Jean could tell you, I was really just like, what am I doing? You know, why am I killing myself um, for this? So instead, what I, instead of just stopping, what I did was I set about in the way that I normally do things, which is this compulsion. And I interviewed 200 LGBTQ people for the ChicagoGayHistory.org website that I created because I wanted to get back to why I do this, and that it's for the people. About 20 of those people have since died. And that was just in 2007. Um, and, and I had regretted that I don't have anything with my mother's voice on it. And I know that the next generation isn't gonna always learn from the printed word that the voice and the face of, uh, of somebody that really says who they were so that brought me back. It saved me. And it just so happened that it led to doing the Out and Proud Chicago book because WTTW, Alex, and Dan were working on this great documentary they were working on and they didn't want to do the book. So they're like, let's see if Tracy will do the book. <laughs> and it, so it just kind of happened. And once I did that book, especially with Owen Keenan's support, he and I just were off to the races. You know, like there are people, especially Chuck Renslow, um, who so many people had tried to tell his story in book form. And same with Jim Flint, Vernita Gray. These were stories I felt that really needed to be told. If I could do anything all time, full time, and not have to worry about paying bills, I would just write about people. Mm -hmm. Because that's really the original motivation from when I was 10 years old mm -hmm. um, to today. Everything else is kind of gravy. Mm -hmm. Well, there is, uh, you're, you're mentioning the very basic reason of why there was a gay press to begin with, I think. Um, giving voice to folks, marginalized community, um, covering issues that mainstream media was ignoring. Um, so you've been a part of it for 35 years. So, so what do you think or see uh, about the gay press of today? What's its role today? And, and what's its significance today? Wow, that's a, that's a really good question because it's dying. The LGBT press around the country is dying. Just like the African American press is dying, the Latino press is dying, the mainstream press is dying. It's, it may, many, uh, many new things will come from those ashes and in a city like Chicago we're really, really lucky because it's a big enough community that that support, that support can sustain it. Um, but many cities are without gay papers now um, and the papers that are remaining, it's, it's difficult. Um, and we're trying to, I think what I feel very fortunate about and there's many of my reader colleagues here tonight um, that I'm really happy my staff from Wittes Times and the staff from the Reader are here tonight. Um, what we're trying to do is really change what community media looks like and can be. So I'm hoping my my post at the Reader, which I'm really fortunate to have, can help lift all boats, including La Raza and the Crusader and Southside Weekly. Like we're trying to collaborate together so that we lift all boats. I have a, a couple of burning fashion questions for you. <laughs> One of the things I like about being short, yes, I'm short, 4'10", <laughs> maybe 4'9", no, I don't know, but um, is that I can be invisible in places I want to be invisible, and um, the, there's not a lot of pressure. Like, I've, I've always felt that. I think there's a curse sometimes to beauty, and I, I'm, I'm going to call out my sister here a little bit, Marcy, who I <laughs> consider Where extremely beautiful, and she, she and I were raised two years apart, and she's two years older. And I saw what beauty can do, right? No, I, what I mean is she had a lot of pressure on her mm. to be this beautiful young girl. And in society, young girls are, are targeted. Mm. And she survived a lot. And I saw that, I witnessed that. And I, and I learned so much from her and I'm grateful for it. Mm -hmm. Because, and my mother, my mother was also extremely beautiful and targeted in her life. 
So I feel like I've always wanted to stay on that margin to be safer. Yeah, I, that's, that was a little deeper than I wanted to go, but I, I don't know anything that about that. That was very deep for your <laughs> 1980s glasses, yeah. I, I must say. Yeah, 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 that was a little deep for that. <laughs> I also heard about your, your prom dress that you wore when you went to Lane Tech. Yeah. It was very blue, gauzy. I wanted to ask you about your, your shoe choice. You remember what I your shoes were? I did wear white gym socks underneath this skirtish dress <laughs> that I went with a gay guy, uh, <laughs> Lewis Morgan, who I'm still friends with his mother. Unfortunately, he passed away from AIDS. Um, he was really good friends with my sister. Um, gorgeous guy. Um, and I, but I, my compromise was I was going to wear white socks with platform sandals on it. Platform so, sandals. Platform sandals. Okay. Sensible shoes. Sensible shoes. Yes. I, sensible and fashionable. Yeah. That's always a plus. Always yeah. a plus. Well, you know, I picked up a copy of the Windy City Times today, and there was a picture of Lori Lightfoot, Chicago mayor, with the headline, Her Storic. And in all of your years in the media, did you ever think that that was going to be on the front page of your paper? The quickest answer is no, but I also want to say why that we got here. Tom Keel, are you here? Yeah. Deborah Shore, are you here? Yeah. Um, and obviously there's people like Ron Sable who are not here. Um, you cannot separate history from the moments that help make it, the good and the bad of it. We got here this quickly because of AIDS, because of serial killers, because of the horrible stories and the good stories combined. It was a mix that made it possible, almost like a rope that pulled history closer to us in possibility. We would not have marriage equality without AIDS. We would not have a lesbian African American mayor AIDS propelled activists, it propelled our community to work together, and it propelled people out of the closet. The closet was our most damaging piece of furniture we could ever have. The internalized homophobia is what damages us. Our familial homophobia, as Sarah Shulman writes about, familial homophobia damages us far more than Reverend Hiram Crawford yelling in my face in 1986. That from 10 years old or two years old or whatever it is, the damages our family can do. By coming out of the closet, the generations before us made it possible that our families might be more welcoming. There's still people that tread on our earth today that kick their kids out from AIDS. They kick their kids out today for being gay or trans, so, or bisexual, right? So I, I feel like Lori Lightfoot, I hope she understands that history that she's standing on the shoulders in the ashes. And it would never have been possible without the people like Danny Sotomayor and all those other people who gave their lives to, to make it possible. Um, if you could interview anyone alive or dead, who would it be and what would the first question be? Wowza. You say alive or dead? Alive or dead. My mother. My mother was an enigma to us. She was as compelled as I was in her own directions in her life. And really, her career suffered being a woman journalist in that era just before mine. She, you know, really had a difficult time. She was forced out of the Tribune when she wanted to cover serious news. And then she went to work for Buckminster Fuller. She went to work on redlining mortgages issues in the African-American community, which is what led to her job at, at Defender. So my mother, unlike myself, who I feel extremely honored and acknowledged tonight and in my whole life, my mother never had that because she moved around so much out of necessity. And I, would, I wanna know what drove her. Her mother died near when my mother was born, my mother died. She was raised by a stepmother who she did not get along with <laughs> at all and had very, very many difficult challenges in her life. And, and I, I was only about 34, 35 when she died. So I, you know, at that point is when you're starting to care about history and yeah, your you parents. Want the, you want the and answers. And I would so love to know what drove her and how she got through the things she did. And I, you know, as I said on Facebook a couple weeks ago, I think about her all the time and have her photos all around at work and everywhere because she's continued to motivate me um, as much as those early people I was covering in the community.
Windy City Times continues its work, daily work. You're still part of the Windy City Times. You own it. I still own it, but my team it. runs it. Yes. Because the reader people know I'm pretty busy over there. <laughs> As was mentioned, uh, you've worked for many of this, the team here at Windy City Times has been around for many years. So I just wanted to, the, to recognize them as well and to have all of us applaud them. So publisher, Terry Klinsky, ex <laughs> executive director, Andrew Davis, <laughs> associate editor, Kirk Williamson, of course, Jean Albright, the director of New Media, circulation director, managing editor, Matt Simonet, and social media director, Scott Duff, and many journalists and, and others who are invested in this very important Chicago Chronicle that has been with us now for 35 years. Let's give them a big round of applause again. Of course, Tracy, you have received many kudos. You've been named among the top 20 women in journalism in Chicago at least twice. <laughs> You've been inducted into the National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association Hall of Fame, the Chicago Women's Journalism Hall of Fame, recognized by the Association uh, for Women Journalists here in Chicago. And I think a lot of people here just consider you a mentor, uh, their teacher, their friend, a person who makes, uh, faces many challenges, but there was one tribute in the newspaper as I was reading it today that said, as you do all of this work and have other people work with you, you always make it fun. <laughs> so for your leadership, your days in the trenches, and your commitment to community journalism and dedication to the LGBTQ plus community, to the city of Chicago. Some applause now for Tracy Bain. And her 35 Thank you. Thank you, everybody.